So I don't think I need to ask this, but are you ready to get into God's word tonight? The word of God is alive and active. And if we're going to be taking in God's word, I think we ought to be receiving God's word in the way that it is alive and active. So feel free to say amen or put your hands together, engage, nod your head, just don't fall asleep. And let's turn in our Bibles, and it's my great honor to be able to ask you to open up your Bible and turn with me to Genesis chapter 40. I want to talk to you today about how God will prepare you in the place of secrecy and obscurity before he can use you in your God-given destiny. Pastor Chuck Smith your pastor's pastor, who was also my pastor. In his memoir of grace, his life story, he was asked by his son who was helping him write his life story, and he said, Dad, what is it that characterizes your life? And within an instant, Pastor Chuck responded and said, the Lord prepares his vessel. And God is preparing you personally, and God is preparing this ministry for what God has for it moving forward. And so I want to talk to you about how God will prepare you before he can use you in the place that he's created for you. I want to share a message with you that I'm calling the dark room. Let's pray. Father, as we open up your word, once again, we thank you for the opportunity that we can come to a church that has a Bible study, a church that teaches God's word, reverences God's word, and hungers for God's word. And Lord, I pray tonight, as once again we gather together as your people, you would meet us here presently, that you would speak to us personally and that you would reveal yourself to us in a way that perhaps we've never seen before because we are here to see you. In Jesus' name, amen. With a show of hands, how many of you here tonight are good at taking photos? Raise your hand. You're good at taking photos. You think you haven't, maybe even just okay at taking photos. Like you think, ah, yeah, I can take a pretty, God bless you. Can I just say the world needs more of you in the world? Uh, more people that know how to take photos. Have you ever been out with some friends somewhere and because you're out with a group, you wanna get your picture taken as a group and so you start eyeing out somebody that's walking by thinking maybe they would be good to take our photo and you try to think of the exact attack moment when you're gonna come in and swoop in and interrupt everything that they're doing to ask them to stop and to take your own picture. And so you go in and you ask them, hey, would you take your photo? And then you hand them your phone. Have you ever handed your phone to shaky hands? <laughs> now, what I mean by that is you, you hand your phone off and they're there and they take some pictures and then you get your phone back and you start looking at the pictures. And every single picture you, they took were completely blurry. Like, were you nervous to take my photo or something? Because could you not hold the camera still for one second as you took one? I mean, you took 3,000 photos. Could you not take one that was not blurry? You ever hand your phone off to the person who takes seven hours to take a photo? You over here scoot in. You over there, you take your job way too seriously. And then you get your phone back after you're smiling. And smiling. And smiling. And then you finally get the phone back and there's one photo. And one photo is not nearly enough because, you know, you need options. Because one photo, usually when you get one photo back, you're making this weird face in it. And, you know, you need a photo that you look good in. It doesn't matter how anybody else looks in the photo. Everyone else could look horrendous and you would be willingly and happy to post it for the entire world to see online 
as long as you look good in that photo. I remember growing up, for some of you, this is going to age me, but growing up, there was a photography class in high school. There was something called film. And in photography class, you would learn how to develop film. And you would have to take the film to a place called the dark room. And the dark room was the place of development because film would have to go through the process of development so you could take it from the dark room into the light to be able for the whole world to see. And there was a long process in the dark room. You had to pull the film out and you had to cut the film. You had to lay it in the water for a certain amount of time, and then after a certain amount of time, you had to take it out and hang it up. Anybody remember the dark room? Anybody remember film? And then eventually, after a long process of development, eventually you could bring it into the light for others to see. Today I want to talk to you about how God has a dark room. And God will take us to the dark room, a place of development for us spiritually, in a place of obscurity and secrecy, before he is able to bring us into our God-given destiny, a place for the whole world to see. And in the dark room, here's what God does. God will develop your integrity and your character in secrecy and obscurity so that you will be ready and usable in the place that God has for you to be. And listen, if you try to rush the process when it comes to developing film, and if you don't allow the time that needs to go by for the process of development to take place, well, the film will be underdeveloped. The picture is washed out. It's almost useless. You ever see an underdeveloped photo? It's the one that's usually thrown out. It's not really nice to look at. It's not really usable. And the same is true for us spiritually, that God will take us through the dark room, and if you try to rush the process of God developing you and preparing you for what he has for you next, you'll be underdeveloped and never ready to step into what God has for you to fulfill your mission and to step in to God's plan and purpose for your life. Now, in our text today in Genesis chapter 40, we see a man named Joseph be taken into the dark room by God. A dark room, literally, because this dark room was a prison cell. It was a place that was a dark, damp dungeon. And I want to remind you how Joseph got to this prison. Because God gave Joseph a vision for his life. God gave Joseph a dream. He was 17 years old when God gave him a vision for his life. 17 years old, and Joseph thought this vision was for now. This vision would come to pass immediately. God, you showed me what was gonna happen. And in this dream, he saw his brothers bowing down to him. So you know what Joseph does? Typical little brother. He goes and he tells his brothers, hey, I had this dream. You guys are all going to bow down to me. Let me just say, his brothers didn't like that very much. And that wasn't appropriate culturally because the firstborn would be the leader of the family. And following the firstborn to the secondborn to the thirdborn, you were in that place of order and precedence in the family. Joseph was the youngest brother until Benjamin came along. He was way down at the bottom of the totem pole. And so his brothers didn't like that very much, so much so Joseph talking about this dream, it caused them to hate Joseph and resent him. And not only did they hate him because of his dream, they also hated him because he was daddy's favorite. You see, Jacob, Joseph's dad, he loved Rachel, the only woman he ever loved. But Rachel died giving birth to Benjamin. Rachel was the mom of Joseph and Benjamin. All the other boys were 
Benjamin and Joseph's stepbrothers. And so Jacob took the love that he had for Rachel and he put it onto the only thing that he had left of Rachel, his two boys. And the other boys saw that dad had his favorite. And so they resented Joseph. And so they grabbed him one day. Perhaps you remember the story. They threw him in a pit. They were going to leave him there to die. But then they didn't want Joseph's death on their conscience. So they figured they would just sell him into slavery. He would probably die anyway, but at least it's not their fault. So they see some Ishmaelite travelers and, and slave owners passing by. And these traders, they, they end up selling Joseph, forcing him into slavery and taking some money for him lying to their dad about it. And now Joseph is taken as a slave to Egypt. And now he's taken as a slave to Egypt. This man, a very powerful man in Egypt named Potiphar, sees this young man who's strong and handsome and good, has a good built to him. It says that Joseph was handsome and in good stature. He, he had the face and the body. He was a good looking dude. And he stood out in the crowd and Potiphar saw him and, and purchased him and brought him into his own home. And Joseph served in his Potiphar's home as a slave. Now, I would think if I was Joseph, I would try to run, escape, but Joseph doesn't. He's faithful where God has him as a slave. And so Potiphar sees that God's hand is upon him. God is blessing Joseph. And so Potiphar entrusts Joseph to be second in command over all of his household. But there's a problem. Potiphar's wife is a floozy. And so she sees this guy who's well-built, got a good bod, has a nice face, total package, and she can't control herself. And so Potiphar's gone at work all the time and Joseph's in the home. And so she starts flirting with him trying to seduce him and tempt him. And Joseph, day after day after day, the Genesis account says, Potiphar's wife is throwing herself at him. And day after day after day, Joseph is refusing that temptation, but finally comes to the point where Potiphar's wife can't stand it anymore. So she grabs Joseph by his jacket and starts trying to rip his clothes off of him. You know what Joseph does? He, I'll tell you what he doesn't do. He doesn't say, well, let's just talk about this. Joseph runs for his life and he hightails it out of there, no compromise, and runs out as she's pulling his jacket off of him. In that day, you would have your cloak and then you have your undergarments, basically what we would call our underwear. She rips his jacket off of him as he's, she's running away from her, left in his chonies. And he takes off running down the street and he gets out of there. But Potiphar's wife, she's humiliated because he denied her again, even in the most forceful advancement she's ever done. So this woman of iniquity that she was, this Jezebel, she, she stands there and she doesn't know what to do. She's holding Joseph's jacket, smelling it. <sighs> Bible doesn't say that. That's just a little loose interpretation. And then she calls for security. Help. They walk in. Joseph, he tried to force himself on me. Potiphar finds out. He's angry. He's mad. The Bible says he's furious. It doesn't say at who, but he's ticked off that this situation happened. Maybe knowing who his wife really is or what his wife is like. Knowing Joseph's a man who fears God, doesn't really know who to believe, so he throws Joseph in prison, the prison of the palace guard, and Joseph's held there. Joseph is now in the dark room. Joseph is hanging out in prison. He had a dream for his life. He had a vision, but now he's in prison and it looks like he's so far from seeing that vision ever come to pass. Now, let me just say, just as God has given Joseph a vision for his life, God has a vision for your life. Acts chapter two, verse 17 says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people 
and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. God has a dream and a vision for your life and it's not up for you to decide what the plan is for your life. It's only your responsibility to get to know the one who knows the plans for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11, God says, for I know the plans I have for you. God doesn't say, you know the plans I have for you. No, God says, I know the plans I have for you. Your role is to get to know the one who knows the plans. What kind of plans does God have for your life? They are plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. The pressure is off of you, and the pressure is off of your life to come up with something to do with your life. You just have to go to God for the vision and the plan he has for your life. And Joseph saw God's plan for his life, but he was thinking this plan was gonna happen right away. And now year after year after year, he is in prison. He is hated by his brothers. He's sold into slavery wrongly. He's falsely accused. And now he's in prison. He's in the dark room. But when these wrong things happen to Joseph over and over and over and over again, he still does good to others. And because of his faithfulness, not only in Potiphar's house, but now in the prison, he's still faithful where God has him. He understands a principle that no man can hinder the plans that God has. And so if that's where God has him, he's gonna be faithful there. And now we pick up in our story as Joseph as a prisoner in Genesis chapter 40, verse one. It says, sometime later, Pharaoh's chief cupbearer and chief baker offended their royal master. Pharaoh became angry with these two officials and he put them in the prison where Joseph was in the palace of the captain of the guard. They remained in prison for quite some time and the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph who looked after them. In the, begin, or in the end of chapter 39, we see because Joseph was faithful in the prison, Joseph was made second in command as a prisoner overseeing all the other prisoners in prison. That's a pretty cool position. I mean, if you're gonna be in prison, you might as well be in charge and run the place. And so Joseph's running the prison now as second in command under the warden. And he puts these two prisoners in Joseph's care. These two prisoners, one is the cupbearer, the other is the chief baker who were the, supposed to be the two most trusted men in Pharaoh's kingdom. The reason, it was a checks and balance system. The cupbearer was the one who would taste all of Pharaoh's food to make sure it wasn't poisoned. The chief baker was the one in charge of preparing all of Pharaoh's food and making sure he didn't poison it. And so the chief baker would prepare the food, the cupbearer would eat the food, make sure it was good. And if he didn't die, they would know it's safe for the Pharaoh to eat. But something happened between these two. Perhaps Pharaoh's intelligence officials found out there was a plot going on. Perhaps there was some poison laced in the food and the cupbearer said, I didn't do it. it. Must've been the chief baker. And the chief baker said, no, I didn't do it. I made it. It was free from poison. And when I gave it to him, he must've poisoned it but somehow they found out there was some funny business going on. When Pharaoh found out about it, he threw them both in prison. Now they're both in prison in Joseph's care and watch what happens in verse five. While they were in prison, Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker each had a dream one night and each dream had its own meaning. When Joseph saw them the next morning, watch this, it says, he noticed that they both looked upset. Why do you look so worried today? He asked them. Joseph's in prison in a place where he shouldn't be because he was sold into slavery wrongly. After he was thrown into the pit, he went from the pit to Potiphar's house to prison and he shouldn't be there. And Joseph could have been full of himself and watching and concerned with himself and 
whenever you're concerned with yourself, you don't notice what's happening around you with other people because your focus is on yourself. But Joseph, he noticed that there is something wrong with these other two guys, which shows that Joseph wasn't concerned with himself where he was at. But he, while he was in prison, he was still caring for others. And then it says in verse 8, after he asked them, why do you look so worried? They replied, we both had dreams last night, but no one can tell us what they mean. And Joseph responds by saying, interpreting dreams is God's business. Go ahead and tell me your dreams. Now, before Joseph does ministry and ministering on behalf of God, he gives God all the glory for what he's about to do. Joseph does not try to take any credit for the gifts and abilities that God has given to him. He recognizes this is something only God can do. And if God wants to do it, he can do it. It's not gonna be about me. The Lord says that he will share his name with no man. One of the quickest ways to stop being used by God is to start thinking it's because you had something to do with it. This, this flourished because, well, I was a part of it. Or that was really good because I did that. I believe that God wants to use each of us to do something that's so beyond ourselves that when people see it, they would have to say, that must have been God. Because they know you. And they know there's no way that you could have ever done that. And so Joseph gives all the credit and all the glory to God for what he's about to do. He says, tell me their dreams. So the chief cupbearer, verse nine, told Joseph his dream first. He says, in my dream, he said, I saw a grapevine in front of me. The vine had three branches that began to bud and blossom and soon it produced clusters of ripe grapes. I was holding Pharaoh's wine cup in my hand so I took a cluster of grapes and squeezed the juice into a cup. Then I placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. This is what the dream means, Joseph said. The three branches represent three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift you up and restore you to your position as his chief cupbearer. And please remember me and do me a favor when things go so well for you. Mention me to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's the only one powerful enough to get Joseph out of his position. Remember me to Pharaoh so he might let me out of this place for I was, a, I was kidnapped from my homeland, the land of the Hebrews, and now I'm here in prison, but I did nothing to deserve it. And when the chief baker saw that Joseph had given the first dream such a positive interpretation, he said to Joseph, well, I had a dream too. In my dream, there were three baskets of white pastries stacked on my head. And the top basket contained all kinds of pastries for Pharaoh, but the birds came and ate them from the basket on my head. Joseph says, this is what the dream means. The three baskets also represents three days. Three days from now, Pharaoh will lift you up and impale your body on a pole. Then birds will come and peck away at your flesh. Pharaoh's birthday came three days later and he prepared a banquet for all his officials and staff. He summoned his chief cupbearer and chief baker to join the other officials. He then restored the chief cupbearer to his former position so he could again hand Pharaoh his cup. But Pharaoh impaled the chief baker just as Joseph had predicted and when he interpreted his dream. Verse 23, Pharaoh's chief cupbearer, however, forgot all about Joseph, never giving him another thought. Joseph was given a God-given vision for his life, a divine destiny. God showed him a glimpse in his future of what was gonna take place and transpire in his life. He was gonna be in a place of prominence that, that he would see his brothers bow down to him. When Joseph received this dream, he was 17 years old. This vision wouldn't come to pass for 20 years until he would be 37 years old. Joseph would wait 20 years. 13 of those years he would spend either as a slave or in prison. 
Joseph 13 years in the dark room. But what I want us to realize tonight that if you are in that place of waiting, maybe God has given you a vision for your life. Maybe God has given you a promise for your family of how God wants to use you. But between the promise of God and the performance of that promise, almost always there is a period of time. And God allows that period of time to develop your character and who you are so that you'll be ready for what God has for you next. I think one of the worst things that can ever happen in our lives is we try to step in prematurely into what God has for us and we're not yet ready for it. And we hinder God from using us in a way that he could because we weren't yet ready for it. Joseph for 13 years would either be in Potiphar's house or in prison. Between the promise of God and the performance of that promise, there's a period of time. And listen, it's not because God is slow in fulfilling his promises. It's not that God is too busy to actually, you know, see that one through. The Bible says that God is not slack in fulfilling his promises. He's not lazy or slow in accomplishing that. It's that you personally aren't yet ready for all that God has for you in your life. Not only was Joseph hated because He had a vision for his life. And Joseph went through all of these things. But God was using those times to prepare Joseph. Whether it was Moses or Paul or Joseph, they all went through periods of time in dark rooms. Whether it was Moses in the wilderness for 40 years or Paul in the deserts of Arabia for three years or Uh, Joseph in the prison for probably about 10 years, maybe longer. God took them to places where they would be developed and prepared for what he had for them next. Listen, God doesn't take you to the dark room to punish you. God takes you there to prepare you so that you're ready to step into the God-given vision that he has for your life so that you will have the perseverance and character, and ability to conduct yourself properly so that you can flourish in the place that God is destined for you to be in. And so God will allow you to go through a period of time to develop you, and in that period of time, there's usually three tests that each one of us will face, and I wanna leave you with these three tests that you need to be able to pass in your spiritual walk with God in order to step into all that God has for you. Write this down, the first test is the test of rejection, the test of rejection. Joseph was rejected over and over and over again. I I have to tell you this, (laughs) not everyone's gonna like you. Welcome to church. Not everyone is gonna like you. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 20, a servant's not greater than his master. They hated me, they're gonna hate you also. He says, if they persecuted me, they're gonna persecute you also. Listen, can I just say, if people rejected Jesus who is perfect, I can guarantee they're gonna find things in your life that they're not gonna like. If they didn't like Jesus who is perfect in everything, and you're not, people aren't gonna like you either. And if Jesus who is the chief cornerstone, who we model our lives after, was rejected and hated, what makes you think that you're going to be accepted by everybody? This is a really important key. If you're going to be good and faithful in ministry, in serving the Lord with your life, you have to be able to deal with and accept that rejection is going to be part of it. Joseph was rejected by his brothers. He was rejected by Potiphar, and now he's in the dark room. He's in prison, but he keeps doing the right thing, and he's blessed. Rejection didn't cause him to stop doing what God had for him. Man's rejection should not keep you from God's direction for your life. And if you care more about what people think than what God has, 
you're never going to be able to step into all that God has for you. Man's rejection cannot keep you from God's direction for your life. The second test is the test of temptation. Potiphar was, Potiphar's wife was the first desperate housewives of Egypt. She came after Joe, she grabbed his coat. But Joseph was able to resist that temptation. Let me tell you how. He was more focused on what God had for him than the temptation that was laid out before him. And if that had the potential to keep him from all that God had for him, he wanted nothing to do with it. I think this not only applies to this area of temptation, but anything in life. So many Christians say, well, I have the liberty to go and drink that. I have the liberty to go there and, and hang out there. And I have the liberty, I have the ability. I'm a mature person. I can handle it. But let me ask you, does it have the potential, even a slight potential to keep you from all that God has for you as a man or woman of God? If so, it's not worth it. In my own life, personally, I've laid aside anything that has the potential to keep me from all that God has for me because it's not worth losing what God has called me to do. It's not worth losing my family over. It's not losing my, worth losing my wife over. It's not worth losing my kids over. It's not worth losing the ministry over because if it has the potential to bring me into bondage, I want nothing to do with it. I don't want anything to keep me from what God has for me. And Joseph here, he was more focused on what God had for him than the temptation that was laid out before him. Joseph would say, you can take my cloak, but you cannot take my calling. You can jack my jacket, but you're not gonna jack my dream. Joseph wanted to be used by God. And although years went by, even a decade and more went by, Joseph never let go of the calling and vision that God had for his life. Let me tell you this, this is important. If you wanna be used by God, you have to be faithful in three areas. You need to be faithful in the first things. You need to be faithful in the little things. And you need to be faithful in the things that don't belong to you. If you wanna be used by God, you need to write this down. If you wanna be used by God, you need to be faithful in the first things. That is what God has entrusted to you first. You need to be faithful in the little things. Whatever opportunity you have, be faithful in that. And you need to be faithful with things that don't belong to you so that you learn the importance of stewardship and stewarding something that isn't yours when you don't get a benefit from it, but others do. Listen, Joseph did not compromise his call and nor should we compromise our call on anything because it's never worth it. Joseph passed the test of rejection. He passed the test of temptation. And here's the third test. And for many, it's the hardest test. It's the test of isolation. God gave Joseph a vision for his life when he was 17. He kept serving, he kept doing the right thing. But now in prison, it looks like he's further from ever seeing that vision come to pass. His brothers live in Canaan a long distance away. He's taken further away from Canaan. Now he's a slave in Potiphar's house, and then he goes even deeper into prison, and it seems like now it would be impossible for this vision to ever come to pass in his life. And Joseph, in a lot of ways, is alone. But this is what I call incubation through isolation. Joseph, is taken alone so he can get to a point where he realizes he has nothing left so that he can realize God is all that he needs. I think so many times in our life, we think we need somebody to come, on, come alongside of us, to help us, to get us to where we believe God's calling us to be. I did that early on in ministry. I thought, People who had other people in their life come alongside of them and lift them up and come alongside of them and help them. And for years, I felt alone in ministry, just 
on my own, and I wasn't, but I felt that way. And the Lord would come to me, and, and I was always making excuses by saying, I don't have a man to help me. I don't have a person. And the Lord showed me I was being a lame man because I read the story of the man that was at the pool of Bethsaida. It's the story of the lame man. And Jesus walks up to this guy because he would lay it by the side of the pool of Bethsaida because when the waters were stirred, the first one in the water would be healed of anything that they had. So all the sick and jacked up and messed up people would all hang out, out around that place. And he would never be the first one in because he was lame and had no one to help him get in the water. So Jesus sees this man. He walks up to him and he says, do you want to be made whole? And you know what he says to Jesus? I have no man to help me. Jesus walked up to that man and said, do you want to be made whole? In other words, do you want to see me do something that you could never do for yourself? Do you want to see me move in your life in the miraculous? Do you want to see your life be impacted in such a way. And he says, I don't have anybody to help me. And I realized that was me telling God when Jesus walks up to me and says, do you wanna see me move in your life in a way that you could never imagine above and beyond anything that you could ever think or dream? Do you wanna see me do something that's so beyond you? Do you wanna see that? And I would say, I had no man to help me. And Jesus is asking you, do you want me to do something in your life miraculous and sometimes we have to come to a point where we're all alone where we have nothing left where we realize all we need is God and God will take you to the place where all you have is him so you realize all you need is him and so we need to be careful though when it comes to the test of isolation that this isn't self-inflicted isolation you need to know that it's God taking you into a season of isolation that's causing this because you aren't meant to live in isolation. Let me just say this for everyone watching online right now. You aren't meant to live in isolation. Proverbs 18 verse 1 says, A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire, and he rages against all wisdom. You need to make sure the season of isolation is not by selection, but that it's by isolation, by divine designation. You need to make sure that you aren't isolating yourself, but it, it's just the place that God has for you to be presently because Joseph didn't isolate himself. God took him there to develop within him some things that he wouldn't have otherwise. And then after Joseph was developed at the right time, when God said it was time, Joseph goes from the prison to the palace because God has a fast forward button. And when God says it's time, in the right time, God can with, flick a switch in a moment's time. He can do with you what you could never do for yourself when you are ready. Now watch this. You have to see this and then we'll go. Joseph because he was faithful where God had him. In Potiphar's house, he was promoted to second in command, in charge of everyone other than Potiphar himself. Joseph then thrown in prison wrongfully, but was still faithful there. And because he was faithful, he was promoted second in command over all of the prison. And now Joseph, in chapter 41, in the next two hours, we're going to go through it together. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Ushers, lock the doors. In Genesis chapter 41, we'll see in that moment's time, Pharaoh has a dream. And then the cupbearer goes, oh yeah, I forgot. Joseph told me not to forget, but I actually didn't give him a second thought. But years later, Pharaoh has a dream. 
And because Joseph was still in prison, they knew where to find him. And Joseph would have never been in the palace where Pharaoh would make him second in command over all of Egypt if Joseph wouldn't have still been in prison. We think this is a waste of time. But the dark room isn't a waste of time. God is using that time to develop within you things that you wouldn't have within you otherwise if you didn't go through the things that you've gone through. And because Joseph was faithful in Potiphar's house and he was faithful in the prison, look what God had for him in the palace. He was running the kingdom second in command just like he was in prison and just like he was in Potiphar's house. But he was just doing it in a greater way. And a lot of people are willing to serve God in the palace, so to speak. They're willing to do it in the place of prominence when it's important, but they're not willing to serve God in the prison or in Potiphar's house. But if you're not willing to be used by God in Potiphar's house as a slave or in prison as a prisoner, then God won't ever be able to use you in greater ways in the palace. And so we have to be faithful where God has us. Luke 16, 10, Jesus says, if you are faithful in little things, then you will be faithful in large ones. In Potiphar's house, to prison, to the palace, God was developing Joseph all along in the dark room so that he could bring him one day into the place where everyone would know who he was. But Joseph would know that it's not because of him because in the prison, he gave all the credit to God. And then if you read the story in Genesis 41 in the palace, when Pharaoh asks him to interpret his dreams, he says, I can't. And then he gives God the glory again. God is the one that he continues to give God the glory. He gave God the glory in the prison and he gave God glory in the palace because he knew it wasn't about him. God will develop your integrity and your character in secrecy and obscurity so that you can be ready and usable in the place of your God-given destiny. A lot of people have big plans because God has created you to accomplish them. But because Joseph was faithful where God had him, those years were preparation for the promise of God. So don't view the period of time between the promise of God and the performance of the promise as a waste of time. It's valuable time because God is using those years to prepare you for what he has for you next. And what led Joseph to that position was simply what he was faithful in doing in prison. No matter whether you're in the pits or you're trapped in a prison, Maybe currently today you're in a place of frustration because you don't see God's vision coming to pass. You don't see the promise that God gave you for your life or for your family happening. Don't ever forget that God is waiting until you are ready. And at the right time, his promises will come to pass. Enjoy the dark room. It's hard, but it's a place of development where God is readying you and preparing you for what he has for you next. Be faithful in the little things. Be faithful in the first things and be faithful with all things that God has entrusted to you and God's gonna use you and God's gonna use this church in great ways in the days and weeks and months and years to come. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you are faithful to accomplish what you've promised to do. That it's not too hard. That it's not too difficult for you. But Lord, if we're not seeing it come to pass, it's because it's not the right time yet. But all along you're preparing us for what you have for us next. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I wonder if there's some here today that would say, I want to be used by God. But you've given up on God's promise and plan, the vision that he's given to you for your life. Maybe you've been in the dark room for a while. You didn't see it come to pass, and so you gave up on 
God's plan for your life. Let me just tell you today that God's not done with you yet. But he's preparing you for what he has for you next. Maybe some here today through this study, your eyes have been open to understanding period of time of waiting is a period of preparation for God to be able to accomplish his plan, to prepare you for it. I pray tonight for each of you that God would free you from the frustration of not seeing that plan come to pass, knowing that God is working behind the scenes to accomplish his plan. And God is preparing you for his plan and all that he has for you. And so, Lord, tonight, we just cast every weight and snare and sin down at your feet. Those things that we've allowed into our lives that have kept us from all that you have for us. Even the things that have the potential to keep us from all that you have for us. I pray, Lord, for us that we would pass the test of rejection, that we would pass the test of temptation, and that we would pass the test of isolation, and that we'd be ready and available to be used by you. Lord, we just wanna see your, your plan for our lives come to pass. So we wait knowing that you are readying us. for When the time comes, we'll be ready to do whatever it is that you have for us next. Whatever you want us to do, help us to be faithful, God, with the first things, with the little things, with the things that don't belong to us. Help us to be faithful to you with what you've given to us now knowing that's preparation for whatever it is that you'll give to us next. Forgive us, Father, for doubting you. Forgive us, God, for second-guessing your plan. And even when we don't understand your plan, we understand that we don't need to understand your plan. We just simply need to obey your command. And God, we desire just to be obedient to you, that you would find us faithful use our lives with our families, with our children. Use us in the workplaces and use us in this place that we call our home, Calvary Chapel of the Chino Valley. Use us, Lord, we pray. In any capacity, we just want to be used by you. So fill us afresh to overflowing with your spirit that you would empower us Give us the fruit of your spirit. Patience. Simply being okay with waiting in the dark room, knowing that you're preparing us for your plans. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.